Welcome to PK Classics, where we honor our upline so we can inspire our downline. My name is Vance Day, and I have the privilege of serving as Promise Keepers president, and this is Lisa Allickson, our co-host. And this program, as you know, is dedicated to really looking at the deep messages that were so integral to Promise Keepers back in the 1990s and the 2000s, all the way up until about 2017. And as we've talked about before, that great vault of information. So, Lisa, who are we looking at today? Vance, today we're going to hear from, I think, the most requested speaker for our next event. When we've taken polls, guys want to hear him again. They were impacted by him in the 90s. They've Radically been impa- impacted. Oh, Radically. Yeah. And I can see why. Mm-hmm. I can see why. This message is so just... It just calls you back to a foundation of what are we doing? Do we realize what we're doing with our 80 years and how it impacts the next mm-hmm. generation? Mm-hmm. That we have a purpose, that we have a destiny. Yep. Yeah, Tony Evans is amazing. And, and he spoke so often at Promise Keepers events in the 1990s. And then he's coming back in Arlington, Texas, Mm -hmm. July 31st, August 1st, 2020. He will be speaking to 80,000 men in the stadium. You know, Vance, I think, too, it's going to be interesting to see what God lays on his heart this time because his Mm -hmm. life has changed a lot. He lost his wife Mm -hmm. in December to an illness. And I just can't help but think as he prepares to speak to 80,000 or hundreds of thousands of men across this country through the simulcast, what he'll say. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if his heart and his thoughts are going to be different or just kind of the same thought on steroids. Well, you know, there was a a YouTube that he did right at the end of 2019 as as Lois, his wife, was succumbing. Um, And, you know, his prayers were still that she would be healed. And that there would be, you know, um, that she would be still part of their family here on earth. But it was such a beautiful, you know, post that he did about just faith and trusting the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then when she passed, you know, he he was saying that she saw her first sunrise in heaven. And it was so sweet. Mm -hmm. And just his standing firm for other families in the midst of his devastation showed such courage and strength. You can't help but that mm-hmm. called up other men and women to to depend upon the Lord as they go through a very, very difficult time. It reminds me of that scripture where it says, keep your eyes fixed on the unseen. Mm-hmm. You know, it feels like Tony's really good at that. Like he's it really is. good at going, hey, do you remember what truth is? Do you remember why we're here? Do you remember what we're doing? And he calls us back to those purposes. You know, I was with Jonathan, his son. Jonathan's an ex-NFL football player and, and a great speaker in his own right. And and Tony was supposed to be speaking at a, a Mighty Man um, event in Fresno, California, Sacramento area, that whole northern California, but wasn't able to come because of the difficulties, you know, his, his wife being near the end. And so Jonathan came. And he, he was so like his father as he stood on the stage. And he did the, if you're a messed up man in a messed up family, continue to do a messed up church. Who, <laughs> then, you know, he just boom, 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 boom. And it was so reminiscent of this, um, this message. Mm. And the men erupted. Mm. You know, we had Pastor Art earlier, uh, Pastor Art Remington, who you ladies and gentlemen may remember is our, um, you know, head of our, our ambassador corps. And he was speaking about how men just absolutely love Tony mm-hmm. Evans. God um, has gifted him. There's no question. He will call you up. He will edify you. He mm-hmm. will divide the word and bring it home in a way that you go, yeah, I want to live mm-hmm. like that. Yes, I can live differently. And mm-hmm. there's a higher purpose and calling. And, you know, I think when that is generated inside a human psyche, when you realize I can be part of something eternal, Mm -hmm. something that God is part of. And I think Tony does a great job of inviting us to that kind of life. So let's now enjoy Tony Evans back in 1995 in Washington, D.C. I bring you greetings from Troy Aikman. (laughs) 
That sounded like the sound of losers to me. No, I, I, I really come humbly. I know that way back in Texas, you know, people can get, you know, real proud, real quick, sort of like the uh, Texan who, uh, who had a big ranch. He went over to Germany, and he really wanted to brag to this German farmer about how big his land was. So he asked the German farmer, how big is, how big is your farm? Well, of course, he only had a few acres. He said, well, it was only about a few acres. Then he began to tell him how big his ranch was. He said, I get in my truck before the sun comes up. And before the sun sets, I still haven't reached the end of my property. German farmer said, yeah, I used to have a truck like that. <laughs> so, uh, so you need to be humble. Some weeks ago, some months ago, I had a problem in my home. I had a crack that had come on my bedroom wall. It was an ugly crack and needed to be repaired. So I called a painter over to fix my problem. The painter came and he removed the old plaster, put up new plaster. It looked brand new. I was happy I paid him. He went home. About a month later, however, the crack reappeared. Somewhat evangelically ticked off, I called him back. <laughs> Told him, please fix my problem. He removed the plaster, replastered it. It looked brand new. I was happy. He was happy. He went home. But then about a month later, the crack reappeared. This time with its nieces, nephews, uncles, aunts, and cousins. I heard a whole family of cracks on my wall. I figured I needed me a new painter. So I called another guy over and asked him to fix my problem. He said, sir, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I said, say what? He said, I can't help you. I said, why not? He said, because you don't have a problem with cracks on your wall. So I looked up at the crack on my wall, then looked down at the crack in front of me telling me I didn't have a problem with cracks on my wall. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? I see a crack, you see a crack. All God's children see a crack. There's a crack on my wall. He said, sir, there's a crack on your wall, but that's not your problem. He says, your problem is you have a shifting foundation. The ground underneath your house is moving, and until you fix that, you will forever be fixing cracks on your wall. Gentlemen, we've got cracks on our wall today. And everybody know, wants to know, what do we do about this generation of young people who are getting in gangs and causing disturbances and bringing about conflict and the madness we're seeing today? I would like to suggest we have a foundation problem, and that is the men of God are not in place as we ought to be in our homes. We have a generation today of children who are growing up without fathers. One third of all families are made up of children who do not have fathers in the home. In my community, the African American community, 63% of all of our homes have absentee dads. By the year 2000, 70% of all black children will grow up without a father in the home. And that means that it's a disaster in the community. Our basic problem today has nothing to do with government. It has nothing to do with what's happening in the media or in education. Our basic problem today is that men are nowhere to be found. We do not have a generation of men who have decided that they are going to take leadership in the home. And it works like this. If you have, are a messed up man and you have a family, then you're going to help create a messed up family. And if you are a messed up man contributing to a messed up family and your family goes to church, then your family will contribute to a messed up church. And if you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family resulting in a messed up church and your church is supposed to be the light to the neighborhood, your church is going to contribute to a messed up neighborhood. And if you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood, and your neighborhood is in the city, 
then your neighborhood is going to contribute to a messed up city. And if you're a messed up man, contributing to a messed up family, resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood, leading to a messed up city, and your city's in a county, then your city's going to contribute to a messed up county. And if you're a messed up man, contributing to a messed up family, resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood, leading to a messed up city, resulting in a messed up county, and your county's in a state, then your county's going to contribute to a messed up state. And if you're a messed up man, contributing to a messed up family, resulting to a messed up church, leading to a messed up city, resulting in a messed up county, causing a messed up state, and your state's in a country, then your state is going to contribute to a messed up country. And then if you're a messed up man, contributing to a messed up family, resulting to a messed up church, leading to a messed up neighborhood, resulting in a messed up city, causing a messed up county, bringing about a messed up state, resulting in a messed up country, and your country's in the world, then your country's going to contribute to a messed up world. So, if you want a better world composed of better countries, made up of better states, inhabited by better counties, made up of better cities, composed of better neighborhoods, illumined by better churches, made up of better families, we need a generation of better men. That is our need today. We need, we need a generation of men who are committed to their children, who are committed to the generation that will follow them. It's like the man who took his son to the toy store and told the proprietor to find his son a toy. The proprietor went up and down the aisle showing the son different toys. The son didn't like any of them. He started to get frustrated with the young boy. He said, here's a toy, and here's a toy, and the boy liked none of them. Finally, the father got upset with the proprietor. He says, why can't you find my boy a toy? He says, because, mister, what your boy needs, we don't sell here. He needs a dad to raise him correctly, and that is the generation we need. We need a generation of men who commit themselves to raising their children. God has established the family as his base institution in the culture. And that's why Genesis chapter 18, verse 19 is so important. Listen to how it reads. God says of Abraham, I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken to him. God says that I have chosen the man to set forth the temperature in the home so that the children grow up to be the men and women that God created them to be. Listen, God didn't give you children so that you could have look-alikes. He didn't give you children just so that you could have offspring. God told Adam and Eve to procreate that they might create image bearers. The reason that God has given us as men the privilege of having children is to give us the opportunities to restamp the image of God on the next generation so that when they grow up and it's time to leave, and they are supposed to leave, when they grow up and it's time to leave, if one lives in New York, you can now know what God looks like in New York on the street where your kid lives because they have the stamp of God on them in New York that you gave them in home. If one goes to Seattle, if you want to know what God looks like in Seattle, they should be able to check out your kid because you put the mark of God on them before they ever move to Seattle. And if one moves to Los Angeles, God forbid, if people want to know what God looks like in L.A., they can have the stamp of God on them because of what you gave. God has created the opportunity to give us children, to give us children, 
so that we would raise a generation who would proliferate the image of God. Listen, men, you are God to your family. God told Abraham the way that your family will see God is through you. And if we are not being the representatives of God that he has called us to be, then the stamp of God will be missing on our children. And so they will grow up with another stamp on them, the stamp of hell. And what we are having today, men, is not a lost generation. What we have today is the product of a lost generation. We have a generation of boys who have never learned to be men because men haven't stayed home long enough to put the stamp of God on them. Our job is to raise a generation of young men and young women who have character and dignity. Tony Evans, that is beautiful, Vance. Mm -hmm. I watch that and I go, yes, the hope and the solidarity he is bringing to, Mm -hmm. here's how it works and it's powerful. Our job. Yes. Our job is to, I mean, how often in culture today do you hear men thunder about our job and take responsibility? You know, this whole culture is about, oh, it's not my job. It's not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. The government will take care of it. You know, we give all these excuses, and I just love how he just nails it, mm-hmm. that God expects us to perform in a certain way, to, to fill those shoes so that men understand what it is to be a man. Vince, can you kind of help bring that home for us, just as a man who has children, mm-hmm. who have a daughter and two sons, when you think about bringing, inviting them to destiny and purpose for the rest of their lives while they're here on earth, how do you how have you thought about investing that in them? Well, I, I think it starts with some key foundation stones. And that's understanding that one, each person is unique in the sight of God and that, that we are here in this place and in this time for a purpose. And when we tell our children that they have a purpose and they have a destiny that is designed by their creator, it places within them ultimate value that they have a mission. Mm. I think the second thing that my wife and I really helped our children to understand. And it's almost a, a, a joke in our family if, you know, if you went to one of my kids and said, well, tell us the capacity versus authority speech your dad gives. It's a speech, yeah. huh? Well, it's a, yeah. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I, I, let me put it this way. This culture has confused the capacity to do an action, to take an action for liberty. And it's not liberty. I have the power to take a gun, the capacity to shoot somebody dead. I can do that, can do that. But I don't have the authority to do that. Mm. It's a mother, can I, mother, may I type of situation. Mm. If we're given a grant of authority by God to do something, to accomplish something, that power or that grant of authority comes with the power to do it. Let me, let me put it this way. People confuse the the statement of Jesus that says, turn the other cheek. Mm -hmm. That's not given to necessarily a father or a police officer or a soldier or a judge. That is a grant of authority to an individual person. Mm -hmm. That under the law of love, when somebody comes to us and asks us for our coat, you give them your wallet too. That's to an individual who has a grant of authority to an individual. Now, I'm a husband, so I have a, a greater grant of authority and more power Part of that duty is to protect my family. You mm-hmm. come and you say, I'd like your wallet, Mr. Day. Oh, and by the way, your wife is really beautiful. I'd like her. Do I give him my wife? No. I, I, I defend my mm-hmm. wife. And that person's going to suffer harm mm-hmm. if he comes against her. And, you know, you use the word power, which isn't a necessarily a popular word Mm-mm. for men to use right now. But if you don't have it, we're all left helpless. Exactly. Men are called to provide, to protect, to partner and promote. Those are the, the things that, you know, Tony's talking about here, that when, when we understand our destiny, we understand our purpose, we understand that our children have to be, they, they have to see a modeling of that behavior. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think about Clarence Thomas, who grew up extremely poor, you know, and during the Jim Crow days, and he, his, it was his grandfather who made a difference in his life. Mm-hmm. Clarence Thomas, who's a U.S. Supreme Court justice, and his granddad said to him, you want to see what a man is like? Watch That's, me. Mm-hmm. 
That's what Tony Evans is telling us, ladies and gentlemen. So let's get back to Tony Evans and continue with this message in 1995 in Washington, D.C. Abraham was to give three things to his children. The first thing he was to give to them was destiny, a sense of purpose. God told Abraham, I have chosen you that I might bring about through you my plan. God has given us children to bring about God's plan. It's like the boy who came to his dad because the dad wanted to have a heart to heart with him. And the dad said, now, son, I want you to make something of your life. So I want you to go to school and get a good education so that you can get a good job, so that you can buy what you want to buy, wear what you want to wear, and live where you want to live. The son said, well, dad, let me make sure I understand. You want me to go to school and get a good education so I can get a good job, so I can live where I want to live, buy what I want to buy, drive what I want to drive, and wear what I want to wear. That's right, son. But dad, why am I doing that? Well, son, it's like this. You go to school and get a good education so you can get a good job, so you can live where you want to live, buy what you want to buy, so when you have your family, you'll have enough money to send your kids to school so that they can get a good education and get a good job and live where they want to live, buy what they want to buy, and wear what they want to wear. Well, Dad, let me make sure I understand now. You want me to go to school, get a good education so I can get a good job, so I can live where I want to live, buy what I want to buy, wear what I want to wear, so I can have my family raise my kids so they can do the same thing. Is that right, Dad? That's right, son. But, Dad, why am I doing all this? Well, son, it's like this. If you go to school and get a good education so you get a good job, so you live where you want to live, buy what you want to buy, wear what you want to wear, so you have your kids, so that by the time you retire, you won't be dependent upon Social Security, you won't be dependent upon the public dole, you'll be able to live out your golden years with ease. Let me make sure I got it, Dad. You want me to go to school and get a good education so I can get a good job, so I can live where I want to live, buy what I want to buy, wear what I want to wear, so that I can raise my kids to do the same thing, so that I can live my golden years with ease. Is that right, Dad? He said, yes, but Dad, I still don't know why I'm doing all this. He said, son, you go to school right now, and you get that job, and you get that education, and you raise your family, and you retire, and then you die, so you can have something to leave behind. And too many of us have raised our kids only to get a good education, only to get a job, only to raise a family, only to retire with some money in the bank, and then to die and leave it all behind. And you will leave it all behind. I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You don't get to take it with you. There is something more men to fathering than simply getting our kids a secular education. We need to raise a generation of men and women of God of boys and girls whose passion is to know God and love God with all of their hearts. There is more to life than simply, than simply that. He says that they were to make sure that they gave their children a purpose. And there is no greater purpose than living your life, men, and raising your family for the glory of God. In fact, that's what our Heavenly Father expects of us. In fact, that's what the Lord's Prayer is all about. Our Father, I want to let you know I know who you are. You're my daddy who art in heaven. I not only know who you are, I know where you live. You live up in heaven. And now that I know who you are and where you live, I know what I'm supposed to do. Get on my knees and hollow be your name. Now, in order to recognize you as my Father because of where you live in heaven and that I might hallow be your name, then I must redo my plan of life so that thy and my, not my kingdom come. And not only must I redo my plan of life, I must redo my schedule so that thy and not my will is done. And if I'm going to hollow your name, service your kingdom, and do your will, you're going to have to give me the starches, fats, carbohydrates, and caloric intake so that I have enough energy to hollow your name, service your kingdom, and do your will. So give me the day-to-daily -day bread I need in order to pull off living for you. And then, Lord, 
forgive me for the sins I've done against you as I forgive those who've done sins against me because if I don't forgive those who've done sins against me, you won't forgive me who's done sins against you. And if you don't forgive me who's done sins against you, you won't accept me hollowing your name, servicing your kingdom, or doing your will. And then don't leave me in anything I can't handle today because if you leave me in anything I can't handle today, I'm going to embarrass your name, embarrass your kingdom, and embarrass your will. And the only reason I'm praying this prayer is because it's got absolutely nothing to do with me because thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. We need today a generation of fathers who will orchestrate their children to a divine agenda, who will say, kid, I want you to be a doctor, but I don't just want you to be a doctor. I want you to be God's representative in medicine so that medicine knows what God looks like when God helps hurting people. Boy, I want you to be a lawyer, but I don't just want you to be a lawyer. I want you to be God's representative in the Bar Association so the Bar Association gets to see what God looks like when God tries a case. And Girl, I want you to be a businesswoman, but I don't just want you to be a businesswoman. I want you to be God's representative in business so that business gets to see what God looks like when God cuts a deal. What God is calling for are fathers to orient the next generation toward him. That is the challenge that we face today. No man ever died wishing he had spent more time at the office. But many a man has died missing, wishing he had spent more time with the kids. We have a generation today who have asked our children to raise themselves. They are doing just that, and they're not doing a very good job of it. The first thing he was to give them is a destiny, a sense of divine relationship. And listen, mister. If you wind up in heaven and some of your kids aren't there with you, all the accomplishments you left behind won't matter. Listen, my favorite game is Monopoly. I love Monopoly because that's the one time in life I get to own land. When I play Monopoly, my Trumpistic tendencies rise in me. Don't let me get Park Avenue and the boardwalk because if I get those, I'm going to hog the board. I do not give loans, and I will charge you all the rent, so you better pass, go, and collect another $200. I always get depressed when the game is over, though, because when the game is over, I got to put back the play money and put back the play land, and I got to get back to the real world. One day, gentlemen, they're going to close the box on you, and when they do, it won't matter what you left behind. It will only matter what you forwarded ahead. And if you didn't put something in eternity, then what you did on earth won't matter. And the main thing we've got to do in eternity is give our children an eternal heritage. So the first thing you must give your children is a divine destiny. Secondly, he says, Abraham, you give your children spiritual discipline. You teach them a standard. We live in a world that does not recognize right and wrong. For the very first time in American history, your children and my children will grow up believing that you can get information without ethics, that you can study the ABCs without moral critique. I remember when I was growing up right down the street or up the street in Baltimore, Maryland, when I do something wrong, when I, when I do something wrong, the neighbor could grab me, spank me, drag me home to my mother, tell on me. My mother would invite her in for coffee and cookies to discuss what I had done wrong. Then my daddy would spank me again because I had embarrassed the family name in the neighborhood. You try that today, you might be looking down the barrel of an Uzi because we have a generation that's tried to raise themselves. God says, Abraham, you command your children in spiritual discipline. I told my son, Anthony Jr., who weighs about 285 pounds, to empty the trash. He said, Dad, I don't feel like it. I said, um, what? He said, Dad, I don't feel like emptying the trash. Now, basically what he was saying is, Dad, as your instruction hits my frontal lobe and move through my cranial area, down my central nervous system, 
out through the nerves that intersect with the motor end plates that tie into my muscular structure, there is not the concomitant emotional stimuli to move my skeletal frame into a trash emptying mode. That's basically what he was saying. To which I said, I can change the way you feel. Because my instruction to empty the trash had no connection to whether he was in the trash that day. It had no connection to what was on TV or what his friends wanted to do outside. He was to empty the trash for one reason and one reason alone, Papa said so. And we need a generation of men who raise their kids according to a standard. And let me tell you something, men, your boys and your kids will more likely do what Papa says do if they see you doing what your Papa in heaven says do, if they see that you honor God. And the first way to do that is to honor the Word of God in your home. Not like the man who wanted to impress the preacher. The preacher came over and he really wanted to impress the preacher that he was a spiritual father and he said, son, I want you to go, and I want you to go get the good book, the book that we love in our family, the book that we read every day. The son ran, he came back with a stack of Sports Illustrated magazines. God is not impressed with what we talk about. He is impressed with what we obey. And we need a generation of young people who receive the Word of God. Did you know that you are the pastor of your children, that the job of the pastor at church is to train the men of God so that they can take it home and reiterate it with their own kids. You are the pastor of your family. And if you're not shepherding your family, then you're not being the man of God that God has called you to be. When's the last time you prayed with those kids? How many weeks have gone by since you've gotten on your knees and gone to God? When is the last time they have seen you on your knees pouring over their well-being in the throne room of God? When is the last time they've seen the family altar established around the table? Unless there is a spiritual discipline, unless you are committed to the standards of the Word of God, you cannot and I cannot raise a generation of godly children. This summer I'm going to come home to Baltimore. And when I come home to Baltimore, my mother's going to fix a big meal. She'll start off with fried chicken, the gospel bird. Then she'll come along with some potato salad and green beans. But then she'll also add some unholy vegetable, like squash or its cousin okra. I can't stand squash or okra. But they're going to add squash or okra, and, 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 and when, when she does that, I pass it on. My mother says, boy, what you think you're doing? I said, I, said I, I, I don't like okra and I don't like squash. In fact, I'm 45 years old now. I ought to be able to decide if I'm going to eat squash or okra. My mother, even today, will say to me, boy, you may be 45, but right now you're 45 in my house. And then look, look, here's, here's what my mother will do. My mother will then take the bowl of squash and put it in my plate for me with my kids watching. In fact, she will put more squash in my plate than I would have put in my plate if I'd have just gone ahead and put the squash in my plate. And then she'll look at me with my kids watching on and say, and you better eat it all. My kids be going, huh, 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 huh. <laughs> Well, sometimes being a father is chocolate cake and vanilla ice cream and German chocolate cake. But sometimes being a father is squash and okra. But you hold on to your role because it's good for the children when you provide a square meal of leadership based on the Word of God. The first thing that they were supposed to give is destiny, but then he was supposed to give discipline. When I came through the airport 
when I went through the metal detector, the metal detector beeped. And it beeped letting you know I had something in my pocket that didn't blow on keys. I had to go back through. We have a generation of children, men today, whose consciences don't beat. They don't feel it anymore. And the consciences have to be developed. And they're developed when young people are given a destiny and when they're given discipline, when they're given sidelines, when they cross the sidelines, they understand that they have now entered into penalty territory that must be corrected and must be straightened out. It's absolute time, then, that we take responsibility for our families. Finally, he says, not only give them destiny and not only give them discipline, but give them dignity. He says in Genesis verse, chapter 18, verse 19, teach your children righteousness and justice. Gentlemen, we have a generation of children today who don't know right from wrong. We have a generation of moral perverts who have no respect for women, who have become a lot like my dog. I let my dog out of the house, and he goes looking for another dog, and any old dog will do. He doesn't care, because my dog is only interested in one thing, satisfying his libido, satisfying his passions. And when he satisfies them, them and comes back home, he doesn't care whether that dog is pregnant or not because his interest is not the other dog, his interest is himself. And when he goes out the next day, he doesn't go looking for yesterday's dog because any old dog will do. We are raising a kibbles and bitch generation. We're raising the Alpo crowd. And we need a generation of godly men who understand the essence of a man is not how many women you can conquer. The essence of a man is your ability to live a lifetime faithfully with one. That is the essence of what it means to be a man. Boy, that distinction is so critical to these, this time. I mean, you, again, we go back to capacity and authority. What he's talking about there is that, hey, guys, you have the capacity, the physical ability to be like, you know, just go have sex with all these women. But that's not the context for intimate relationships. Men don't have authority to have sex with a lot of women. They have the capacity to do that, but not the authority. Why? Because God designed sex. He designed it for what? For a covenant relationship for life. Only in that covenant relationship, the covenant bounds of marriage, is that beautiful thing called intimate mm -hmm. relations between a man and a woman designed to be. Mm -hmm. Because then it's protected. Then there's trust. And the problem with today's society is, again, we've confused the ability to take an action, our capacity, with the authority, the permission to take that. You know, I love that it, about God's truth. Anytime you go to study it, like they've researched who are the happiest, most fulfilled couples mm -hmm. sexually. And it's the couples that have been with one partner for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So God creates that boundary for our own good because that's good. what's going to bring joy. Because he knows that that's what it's created for. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I had a professor in law school who gave the example. He said, look, if you want to know what an what a an invention is meant to do, talk to the inventor. Mm. For, and he would say, well, for example, a lawnmower. I, I have the capacity, he'd say, to take a lawnmower in and vacuum the carpet here in this room. It'll do an okay job, but is that what it's designed to do? Absolutely not. It's meant, designed to mow lawns. Mm -hmm. I can try to make it a vacuum, but it doesn't work that mm -hmm. way. It, if you use it for its intended purpose, then it works. Sexual intimacy belongs within a covenant relationship between a lifelong partner, between a man and a woman. That's how God designed it. You know, I, I also appreciated how he talked about being a filter in your home. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that's a hard thing, whether it's video games or how you do Halloween or what words everybody's going to say or how discipline is going to be carried out. Having a, a healthy filter that where a guy is connecting to God and ask, seeking his wisdom and other men's wisdom is, is huge. You know, mm -hmm. that wasn't always a part of my story mm -hmm. in the past. And so when I heard 
Dr. Evans talk about that, I'm like, yes, because that just protects the home. It does. It keeps mm-hmm. it on the outside. Like, we're not dealing. That is no. Uh-uh. <laughs> you know, when, when my wife and I were raising our, our kids and they were small, we came into unity in that. And unity is critical between a husband and a wife in what you're going to allow into the home. And I, I had a neighbor. He was an old World War II veteran, 101st Airborne. And uh, he loved to just be with our family. He was Uncle, he was Grandpa John, even though he wasn't part of our family. And he, he made an interesting observation. He said, you know, Vance, you and your wife have made a really good choice because you, you're, you're keeping your kids pure. And when, when the sewer's going by, the dirty water, you can't take that dirty water and add it into your cup of clean water. And the cup of clean water makes that dirty water pure. Mm. It doesn't. Mm. Keep them pure, he kept on saying. Mm. And it really is critical. We forget that all this information coming in, if we don't protect our children and our grandchildren mm-hmm. and, and help them understand that God's created them for a purpose and a destiny and that the, the opportunity to become great in God's kingdom is, is part of, you know, the part of that process is understanding our calling. And our calling isn't to be out there just allowing all this stuff in. And it's really good, ladies and gentlemen, how Tony Evans brings this home. Capture this, the next little bit of his speech. It is good. You're going to enjoy it. Fathers, you are the filters of your home. Anything that comes into your family must come because you've given it permission to come there. And if you don't give it permission, it ought not come into your home. Your children ought to know that these are the standards. And as for me and my house, we going to serve the Lord. But they going to say, but Johnny's dad. But this ain't Johnny's house. This is my house. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We need a generation of men who've got the guts of their conviction. And this is what Abraham was to do, build a new civilization. But not only that, he was to bring justice to society. We've got a generation of single parents whose boys will never know what it is to have a father unless the men of God step in. God never intended for there ever to be a boy who didn't have a dad. That's why at our church we've guaranteed that every single parent in our church will have a male who will become a surrogate father on behalf of every boy that doesn't have a dad in his home. I have two of them myself, and two of those boys belong to me. And when I take my boys, I take them, because I have a bigger role to play than just me and my sons. I've got to make sure that the neighbor's son is covered as well. We have a program like that that we share with other churches and show them how to do it. One boy stole $1,500. He stole $1,500 and they caught him. When they caught him, they were going to send him to jail for three years, $18,000 a year for stealing $1,500 so that the person wouldn't be paid back. The church went down there and we said, give the boy back to us. We'll save the taxpayers $18,000. We will put a male mentor over him, give him a job, garnish his wages, pay back the guy he stole from, and bring you a brand new kid in six months. We did all of that. We took the boy. We became, we became his father. We became his surrogate dad. We took him back to the judge in six months. He was awestruck that the boy had been transformed by godly surrogate fathers. He called me back two weeks later and said, will you take 20 more? And that's exactly how it's supposed to work. The world should be coming to the church for answers because we are the people of God. We should have the answers. Now you say, you say, wait a minute. You say, it's too late. I've already messed up. No, it's not too late, because God can take lemons and make lemonade. God can take a messed up situation. My wife is a good cook. Whenever she cooks on Sunday, she never throws away the leftovers. Because on Monday, she's going to create a brand new dish no one has ever heard of. She's going to dice it and chop it and stare it and put a little cream of mushroom over it. 
give it a new name, and we're going to think it's brand new cuisine when all it is is the leftover from the day before restirred. If you will give God the leftover, whatever failure you have with your kids who may be teenagers now and rebellious, whatever failure you had with them gone now, if you will give God the leftover, he can dice it, chop it, put a little cream of Holy Spirit over it, and give you a brand new chance to have a brand new lease on life if you will give him your life. But that means me. But that means me. It means that you're going to have to get off on the next exit called repentance exit. Cross over over the grace overpass. Come back down on the other side, restoration on ramp. And go back in the direction you ought to go. And let the grace of God help you to make up time you lost because of failure in the past. You can't solve what you didn't do yesterday, but you can do a heck of a lot about what you're going to do tomorrow, and that's deciding to become a man of God. My favorite program growing up was Superman. Boy, I love me some Superman. As Clark Kent, he was a bumbling idiot. Lois Lane couldn't stand him. Jimmy Olsen didn't respect him. Perry White wouldn't use him. Oh, but don't let him find a telephone booth. If he found the telephone booth, Everybody was in trouble. My man would go inside a telephone, but somebody would say, when the criminals of Metropolis would come out, where's Superman? I'd be sitting on the floor with my brother. Clark Kent would take off his glasses, unhook his tie. I look at my brother and say, there he go. <laughs> Clark Kent would go inside a closet or a telephone booth, and in a few seconds come out with a red and blue jumpsuit on. He'd come out with a big S on his chest. Now he was faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive. He could now leap tall buildings with a single bound. He'd go streaking across the sky and they say, it's a bird. No, it's a plane. Uh-uh, it's Superman. And all of a sudden, when he came out, the complexion of the community changed because now he would catch bullets with his bare hand, break guns, break the nozzle of guns, take criminals who were bringing havoc and discard them, all because he changed his clothes. And that's because he really wasn't from here. He was from another place called Krypton. And up in Krypton, he had a power that when he transferred it here, didn't make him an ordinary man, it made him a superman. If you know Jesus Christ, you're not from here. You're from a whole nother place. It's called heavenly places. If you know Jesus Christ, you're not from here. You belong to the family of God. So listen, men, take off that old way of thinking. Take off those old clothes and start being who God saved you to be. Take a trip to God's telephone booth and put on your spiritual jumpsuit. Come out with an S on your chest so that you are faster than speeding sin, more powerful than public unrighteousness, so that you're able to leap evil in a single bound. You say, but I'm not Superman, but you are saved. You say, I'm not Superman, but you are a saint. You say you're not Superman, but you are sanctified. So go back home and say, kids, it's a new day now, because Super Dad has now arrived. Become a man of God. That's what God has called you to be. Be God's Super Dad's at home. Here's what I want you to do. Men, remain standing. And I want us to pray for our children. I want you to get it in groups of three or four. And if there's a brother in that group with a burden, I want you brothers to give him a chance to express it. He may have a wayward son or a wayward daughter. He may be regretting over what he didn't do for the last 15 years with his kids. 
but he sees that kid out there and he wants the Holy Spirit to put a beeline on that kid and go after that kid and let the hound of heavens be sicked on him until that kid comes back home. And I don't want that brother to pray alone. I want him to know that there are a group of other brothers that care about his children and that will go in burden for him. There may be a brother there who is burdened about what's going to happen in the future. I know that there are some black brothers here who are raising their kids in the inner city and are scared for their children's lives. They're not worried about whether their kids are going to become a doctor. They're worried about whether their kids are going to live to be 18. And he's going to need prayer and support and encouragement from a group of brothers who say, we will pray with you about your children. And I want the brothers to know here that we care enough for each other to pray about the well-being of our kids. So if you'll establish semis, little mini circles right where you are, and any brother that has a burden about his children on his heart, if you will pray for him and pray with one another that God in his power will bring deliverance in the life of that child or in the relationship between the father and his son or daughter. Do that right now. Ladies and gentlemen, that really is a good suggestion. Let's take this moment right now and let's pray for our children, for our grandchildren, for those that are in our lives. Heavenly Father, we come before you so grateful that you are our Father. You are our Abba Father, our, our Daddy. Seems strange to call you that, but that's what we do as your children. We call you our Father. And Lord, you've called us to parent children, to grandchildren, to be a, a substitute parent to many children. So Father, we just lift up our kids right now, those that are under our care, under our authority, Lord, would you give us wisdom? Would you give us insight into who they are that we may guide them gently? And for those who have little children, Father, we just ask that you would give them that, that sense of where the boundaries need to be according to your word, that those kids may be raised up in a way that they will not depart from when they're older. We're so grateful, Father. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In advance. I think about the kids that we have in our lives that aren't seeking God. Maybe a viewer has prayed for their child for a long time. Mm -hmm. I love how Tony says, we're going to stand with each other mm -hmm. for our kids, and mm -hmm. we're going to fight for that next generation. And how they do it even outside of their own families is so cool. Well, and, you know, the concept that, that I think about is my mother, you know, who, who prayed for our family. I was the first believer in our family when I was 14, and then my mother came to know Christ soon after that during my parents' divorce. And, and through her last day, she prayed consistently for my sisters. Love my sisters. They're wonderful women. They haven't professed Christ yet. But, you know, her prayers are still circling the throne. Mm -hmm. They're still active. I mean, God's Word says until the... The bowls are filled, as he says in Revelations, mm -hmm. and then poured out. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you pray, you know, those prayers are effective. I'm the result of my fourth great-grandmother's prayers. I read her notes to her sons, wanting her sons to come to Christ. They didn't, that mm -hmm. I know of. My grandfather didn't come to Christ. My dad didn't come to Christ until his deathbed. Mm -hmm. Those prayers, I'm the result of those prayers. So don't give up praying. God will answer those prayers. And it's so important. I love how Tony talked about being a surrogate father and mm -hmm. how his church works in that way. The church is designed to step in when there's a breakdown in the family, not the civil government. Mm -hmm. God drew some real clear lines. It is the family's authority to educate children, not the government's mm -hmm. authority. It is the church's authority to reign in heresy and, and to, to say what is correct according to Scripture. And when the family breaks down, it's the church that should step in, mm -hmm. not the government. You know, as a person who was a single mom of three boys for about 10 years, that would have—I mean, I just would have melted— I, I would just would have wept if somebody would have come up to me. And, and God did provide men in my life who stepped in and invited my boys. My dad was significant and overtook a lot of that. But, you know, that's that ministry is is huge. It is huge. Imagine. I mean, I love how Ken Harrison, our CEO and 
and chairman of the board, how he states it. Imagine how the world would be changed if every single man, two men together, began and adopt began to adopt other young men and minister to them, mentor mm-hmm. them, be surrogate fathers. Mm-hmm. It would change the whole course of where we're going. You know, Vance, I think our event this summer, July 31st and August 1st, might be a great place to start. Mm. To invite the boy in your neighborhood or in your church or in your school that you see him kind of floundering and mm. maybe you don't even know how to get started, but invite him to come to the Promise Keepers gathering to stand with 80,000 mm. other men who just say, Jesus is God and I'm going to live for him. You know, and I, I thought about it myself. I, I've been writing my friends saying, I would feel bad if I didn't invite you because I was somehow fearful. You can go to a simulcast. You can go to the event, July 31st, August 1st. It may change your life. Thank you for joining us on PK Classics. And as we leave this episode, we want you to see this this promo video for the event. is the condition of the church. We've come to stand together, hearing the call of God from the eternal word of scriptures that there would be a man who would stand in the gap. Indeed, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son He is the only way. Pray out a prayer to him of confession and brokenness and cry to him for forgiveness and for victory. So that from Alaska to Florida, your will, not our will, as it is done in heaven, so that people see not us, but they see Christ in our actions. We're going to start to lift up our pastors. We're going to start to stand in the gap for our preacher. We're going to pray around the clock. We're going to build these men up. We need great leadership. Let's rally them. Let's ignite them. We can change the spirit of this nation. We must represent together a new spirit for the world. You have been called from being a slave to the devil to being a slave of Jesus Christ. We are somebody because we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm a child of the King. The greatest thing that can happen is for Christians to rise up and take this country for Christ.